I'm Leah Triplett Harrington. I'm the Director of Exhibitions and Contemporary Curatorial Initiatives here at PAFA. Um, and I have the great pleasure of welcoming Allie Prince back to PAFA. Um, our, she's our uh, Terra Foundation cur Curatorial Fellow and the curator of Layers of Liberty, Philadelphia and the Appalachian Environment, which, which is up now in our Annenberg and Tuttleman galleries. So we are thrilled for Allie to be here um, giving us a talk on titled Appalachian Art Presence and Absence in American Museum Collections. Um, we are really grateful to the Barron family um, for supporting these Art at Noon lectures in memory of Rose Susan Hirshhorn Barron, a former docent at the Academy and great supporter of our education programs. Um, so thank you for making, making this time possible and for all of you for being here to um, spend your lunch hour with us. Um, Ali Prince is, as I mentioned, the Terra Foundation Curatorial Fellow at PAFA. She is also a PhD candidate in art history at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University and a practicing artist based between Philadelphia and Appalachia. Her research investigates the Appalachian regionalism in modern and contemporary American art, eco-criticism, and the intersections of fine art and craft. She received a BFA in painting and a BA in art history from West Virginia University and an MA in contemporary art from Sotheby's Institute of Art, New York. Um, and her research has been supported by Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Center for Curatorial Leadership. Um, so I am really excited to have Ali back here um, as just kind of I think, Ali, you were just at the forefront of thinking about Appalachian art and how it's presented in our cultural context. So I think we're in for a real treat. Um, Ali is going to give a lecture for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have about 15, 20 minutes at the end for Q&A. So please get your questions ready. Um, you can put them in the Q&A function or the chat, and I um, will facilitate making sure your question gets answered. So. Without further ado, uh, thank you, Allie, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Leah. I am very excited to be back at PAFA. Let's see if I can get this going. percent good at this. It can go dry either. Even okay. if I turn it off. Yeah, we'll just we'll just ask everyone to mute themselves if um, during the lecture. Thank you so much. Having some issues with starting this slideshow. Sorry, guys. Un momento. Okay, here we go. All right. So everyone bear with me. I'm moving a little slow today. I'm in the process of finishing my dissertation. I'm defending in a month. So it's been very intense, um, but hopefully I can uh, get your questions answered and give you a lot of background on Appalachian art and the Layers of Liberty show. So I'm kind of, um, my strategy for this talk is to start kind of from a broad perspective and get more specific. Um, so what I wanted to start with is basically showing everyone what constitutes the Appalachian region of the United States. So the map on the left is what the Appalachian Regional Com Commission considers Appalachia to be. Um, and if you look at this map, there are some little like weird uh, spaces that jut out um, that are kind of more uh, what you wouldn't consider part of the Appalachian region, but there are some political additions and things that happened in the 60s when the commission was established. But essentially, uh, the Appalachian region constitutes a geographic boundary as well as a cultural boundary. Um, and then the map on the right shows you kind of the subregions of what is considered to be Appalachia. So the Pennsylvania portion would be considered Northern Appalachia. And that's what obviously Layers of Liberty is more focused on. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you feel a connection to Appalachia in some way, whether it's like familial or you've spent time there or you have some sort of like association with it from friends or whatnot. But most people have some sort of connection or understanding, even if it's a basic understanding of the Appalachian region. Um, so I want you to think about as I'm talking what you consider to be Appalachia, what feels like Appalachia to you from your context. Um, so I wanted to just elaborate a little bit about myself, um, just so you have some more context as to why I went into the study of Appalachian regionalism and trying to kind of suss that out. 
um, in American art. So I was born and raised in West Virginia. Um, I grew up in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, so if, if y'all are familiar with Harper's Ferry, um, that is the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, I also grew up around Thomas, West Virginia too, which is considered to be like coal country. It's kind of the armpit of West Virginia. So I have this experience that's kind of this Eastern Panhandle experience, which is adjacent to Washington DC and Baltimore. And then this experience uh, with coal country and kind of the more impoverished areas of West Virginia. So basically, Long story short, uh, I did not start out uh, studying American art. I actually started out studying Latin American art, um, and I wasn't really forthright and open about my cultural heritage as an Appalachian and someone from West Virginia um, until I spent time in New York City um, and basically had a reckoning after I finished grad school um, as to why I felt insecure about being from Appalachia, why I didn't tell people I was from Appalachia. Um, and then I kind of started thinking about why that is and why Appalachia isn't really mentioned in the history of American art or really in the humanities um, at length, even though the region constitutes about a third of the country. So that brought me to studying, basically taking on this PhD to try to figure out what is Appalachia? What is Appalachian regionalism? Why is it missing from this narrative? Um, so that's kind of what this background is. Um, so basically, since I began my PhD in 2017 at Temple, um, I've had several fellowships, um, which I'm very grateful for, and I've had the chance to um, deep dive into museum collections, not just at PAFA, um, but also at the Smithsonian and at Crystal Bridges. Um, so unfortunately, when I was at the Smithsonian as a predoctoral fellow, it was right during the height of COVID. So I didn't get a chance to look at a lot of work in person because of that, unfortunately. But I did get a chance to do a lot of online research and thoroughly go through their TMS system and look at what I consider to be Appalachian art, which I'll explain that shortly. Um, and then following that Smithsonian Fellowship, I was at Crystal Bridges in Arkansas, um, and I did something very similar, but I actually had a lot more hands-on experience in Arkansas because it was um, kind of post-COVID, and I was able to deep dive into their collections. And then when I got to PAFA, I was working on the reinstallation, so I was able to kind of do reinstallation work and also think about Appalachia in PAFA's collection um, from that same perspective. So as Leah mentioned in my bio, um, I'm also a practicing artist. So I just wanted to very briefly talk about my art practice, which goes hand in hand with my curatorial practice and my scholarship as well. So I essentially um, look at the archive, um, the Appalachian archive through photos and the history of Appalachia and extraction and kind of um, history repeating itself as well as the history of craft and kind of cultural aspects and, and incorporate those into the archival photos and research that I do um, to kind of create plays on contemporary and past together. Um, and I like to use found objects and discarded fabric and coal and things like that to kind of tell my story a little bit more um, about Appalachia. In addition to being a painter, I do inter interdisciplinary work uh, with another friend of mine who's from um, coal country, West Virginia. Um, our collaborative is called Crick Holler. And basically we kind of investigate histories of mining and labor and class in West Virginia and create these kind of all encompassing installations um, that have VR components and like fine art components and light components and sound components. Um, and most recently we've been working on a project that deals with um, for those of you that remember Magic Eye from the 90s, um, we've been working with Magic Eye technology, which is called a stereoscope, um, to kind of play around with iconography of mining history in West Virginia and Appalachia. So just a little bit about my artwork. It'll all make sense, I promise, um, once I get through this slideshow and explain myself. So background. 
Um, just to give you a little um, understanding about cultural erasure in Appalachia and how that happened. So um, the industrialization of the Appalachian region didn't really happen um, in earnest until after the Civil War. Obviously, there was stuff happening in Pennsylvania with the anthracite coal, um, and there was some coal mining happening and obviously timbering, but it didn't reach the level that it is at now um, until the Industrial Revolution. And then it persisted really, really heavily until the 1930s, I would say, and then it started to kind of drop off. So there was a period of about 50, 60 years where it was very, very heavily industrialized um, basically all sorts of natural natural resources being taken from the region. Um, but prior to this, the Appalachian Mountain Range was considered to be um, the first American frontier. It was kind of like the dividing line for westward expansion. Um, and a lot of people didn't cross that line or not many people crossed that line. But when waves of immigrants came in, um, in the 17th and 18th century, specifically German and Scots-Irish immigrants, they settled in the mountains because they basically wanted to get away from people and have their own land and be separated. And there was a lot of uh, kind of democratic things that were happening in these little enclaves. Um, in addition to the indigenous populations that were there, there was a lot of um, freed slaves runaway slaves, all kinds of things that were happening in the mountains that have really not been considered outside of the field of Appalachian studies that I've been looking at in terms of constructing this regionalism. So um, in this slide here on the left, you obviously see mining. Um, and on the right, you see timbering and also this kind of um, introduction of the railroad on a small scale and then later at a larger scale. Um, but essentially, uh, what I found in my study of Appalachian regionalism is that this industrial history, this switch over from like a barter economy amongst these mountain people to a labor, wage labor economy, is what led to this erasure of Appalachian culture um, and overlooking of Appalachian culture and others basically telling the narrative of Appalachia um, for Appalachians. So... Um, I wanted to question, have this in the back of your head, what you think about when you think about Appalachia. If someone asks you about West Virginia or Appalachia, I'm sure many of you think certain things um, that are often associated with stereotypes. And as you're going to see in these next several slides, there are a lot of stereotypes that are associated with Appalachia that are so deep that they are literally ingrained in our popular culture to the point that it's like normalized. Um, so think about what comes to mind. Think about why you think this. Um, so in terms of stereotypes, there's several that I'm going to go through with these slides. There's kind of this dumb, antiquated, our contemporary ancestor type deal. There's this association with violence and clannishness, as you can see with the Hatfield and McCoy feud, and then how that translated into popular culture with this book cover. Um, but also thinking about um, and I found this in my dissertation research, but it's been well researched in Appalachian studies that um, as land speculation started happening in the region, in tandem, um, print culture through periodicals and journals and newspapers started publishing more imagery of Appalachian people. And in essence, this was to um, create an understanding of what the public would think about Appalachia so they could essentially come into the region and modernize it. So if, you know, Appalachians are violent, they need to be quelled. If Appalachians are stupid, we need to help them. We need to help them be modernized and so on and so forth. So, um, and as that happened, the switch to wage labor and these preconceived notions of Appalachia, you know, just became ingrained in culture. So basically, you can find these stereotypes in every possible form of media, um, from books to prints to paintings to photographs to sheet music, you know, you name it, movies, it has become ingrained um, and essentially overshadowed true cultural values of Appalachian and their Appalachians and their art production and so forth. So 
Um, this is an example of the antiquated stereotype that I mentioned. And obviously during the New Deal and this Appalachian craft revival that happened between the wars, there are a lot of photographers that work for the FSA, but also fine art photographers like Doris Ullman, who were photographing Appalachians, but they were staging a lot of these photos to kind of like play off these stereotypes that were longstanding from the 19th century forward. Um, so the next stereotype I mentioned, uh, this would be like the poor white trash stereotype. So, you know, with this James Henry Beard painting from 1845, it kind of predates the period I was talking about, but things started to kind of happen before the Civil War, but they ramped up during Reconstruction with the stereotyping after the Civil War. So as you can see um, with this Nancy Lee in the Hilltop or sheet music, you know, it's perpetuating the stereotype 100 years later of this kind of poor white trash situation. And then ultimately, um, we have what's become ingrained in Appalachian culture. And um, as I was a fellow at PAFA, I was also a fellow at the Library Company and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So I got a chance to look at a lot of resources related to Appalachia in their collection. Um, and this is one of the um, the cartoons that I found at the Historical Society when I was looking there. But it, again, proves kind of my um, hypothesis that, you know, these stereotypes are ingrained and they overshadowed cultural production. So I'm kind of going to... Sorry, there we go. So the stereotypes that I mentioned, nothing overshadows them like the history of coal mining. I think that's probably one of the first things people think of when they think about Appalachia or West Virginia is the history of extraction. Um, and it's kind of this doomed, hardened, impoverished coal miner that has permeated um, all kinds of things um, when thinking about Appalachia. So um, as you can see here in this slide, I mentioned between the wars during the WPA, there was a lot of, um, you know, appropriation of Appalachian craft because of the craft revival, but there was also a lot of appropriation of industry and labor, um, and that translated through WPA prints and the graphic arts division and also through the FSA photographers like Marion Post Wolcott and Ben Sean. Um, so, you know, Appalachian visibility is there, but it is this kind of curated form of um, what Appalachia, how does Appalachia serve the narrative of, of nationalism um, and how that, you know, plays out in craft, labor, all these things. So um, I also wanted to mention, so before this permeation of stereotypes, this is what Appalachians were referenced as. So like Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, they are examples of this like frontiersman that's really brave and can kill wild animals and kind of tame the wilderness. This was the notion of Appalachian people prior to land speculation and extraction and this switch to wage labor. Um, Crockett and Boone were like the heroes the national heroes associated with the Appalachian region that were then superseded by these stereotypes. Um, so also wanted to briefly mention for those of you that are unfamiliar. So this um, narrative of the stereotypes actually overshadowed a lot of history um, that's really important. Like the largest labor uprising in American history was the West Virginia Mine Wars. This was all happening at the same time, you know, this imagery of miners was being disseminated into American culture. So essentially that West Virginia Mine Wars history was erased and this bra the bravery of these miners to stand up to try to get fair wages and fair treatment and safer conditions was overshadowed by these stereotypes. And this was actually edited out of American history until recently. Um, and the term redneck, which is a derogatory term, um, was actually based on the history of these miners wearing red bandanas in protest. Um, so 
thinking about the history of redneck and what that association is, it actually was a, a symbol of pride um, at one point in American history. So hopefully that uh, gets shouted from the rooftops and incorporated them into the American history narrative. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit um, now and talk about Appalachian, Pennsylvania as we kind of get into the Layers of Liberty um, show and how I conceptualized it. So um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Basically 70% of the state is Appalachian. Basically this yellow portion on the left-hand slide um, is the only part of the state that isn't considered to be Appalachian, but all of the rest of it is either rural, rural or metro Appalachia. And then the map on the right is the anthracite coal fields um, in Pennsylvania. So none of these are active, obviously. They kind of shut down in the 30s, 40s, slowly tapered off um, in the 20th century. But um, you can see how massive these coal fields were. Um, so another thing that's important to consider, which I mention in Layers of Liberty in Earnest, is that um, anthracite, mi anthracite mining in Appalachia, Appalachian, Pennsylvania specifically, started in the late 18th century. Um, and in the Lehigh Valley, anthracite was essentially discovered to be this really clean burning um, form of energy that burned for a long time. Um, and because there are all these canals already in place, they started mining anthracite and shipping it into Philadelphia and New York and all of these places. And then obviously the railroad was established, so that ramped up. But people like Stephen Girard were funders of anthracite coal production. Um, so the city of Philadelphia became very, very wealthy because of anthracite coal. And the moniker of workshop of the world would not have existed if it wasn't for anthracite coal. So um, Appalachian coal literally built the East Coast um, and fueled the nation, essentially. It would not have happened without that. Um, so it's important that we pay attention to that labor history and that class history and that environmental history because it's essentially a microchasm for how our nation was built and the problems that we are dealing with now. Um, so as I mentioned before, anthracite coal kind of started tapering off in the 1930s. There were a number of disasters that kind of topped that off. Um, but, you know, the ecological damage still exists from all of this. Um, we're dealing with the effects of climate change. We are dealing with places in Pennsylvania like Centralia, which is on fire forever because it is burning coal reserves under the ground. The whole area is abandoned because of it, essentially, but also areas of acid mine drainage um, that are just left. There's not remediation a lot of times of these sites, even though they're supposed to be. So we're dealing with these remnants um, and, we'll, and we'll continue to deal with them until we uh, switch to a cleaner form of energy and kind of undo the wrongs that have been done. Um, so now you have a little bit of a history of Appalachia and Appalachian Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm going to move into talking about exhibitions and layers of liberty and how to approach Appalachia in museum collections. So um, from my understanding of researching Appalachian art, um, there is not a lot of history of exhibitions dealing with Appalachia outside of the region. Um, and when there are, that history is based in craft or it is based in contemporary art. So there have been, um, I have three exhibitions here that I wanted to touch base on. Um, one, the very first one that I'm aware of um, is More Than Land or Sky, which I actually named um, one of the themes of Layers of Liberty after. And it's based on a book that was written about Western North Carolina in the 19th century. Um, it was kind of like local color literature, but also um, used by land speculators to come in and uh, buy coal and timber. So more than Land or Sky was at what is now the Smithsonian American Art Museum. It was then the National Museum of American Art. 
Um, and it was in tandem uh, with the Appalachian Regional C Commission, essentially. So um, the curator, Barbara Schisler Nasenow, um, came up with this, ex and she's from Roanoke. She was from Roanoke, Virginia. So she herself was Appalachian and basically traveled throughout Appalachia and found um, contemporary artists. I think there were 61 in this exhibition that then traveled around Appalachia after it was at the Smithsonian. And then just a few years ago um, in Asheville, Appalachia Now was an exhibition. Um, and that curator was a New York-based curator that didn't have any background in the region. Um, his name is Jason Andrew. Um, and then uh, ongoing, um, the, the William King Museum of Art has an Appalachian um, contemporary biennial, which I was lucky to curate last year, but, but it's been happening for about 30 years. So um, Appalachian now and from these hills are contemporary Appalachian shows. There's really no shows that I'm aware of um, prior to Layers of Liberty that were looking at Appalachian art production from a historical perspective. So um, basically in Layers of Liberty, um, the conception of it happened while I was doing research for the reinstallation and doing a lot of work in the vaults in the historic landmark building, but also in the Hamilton building. Um, basically, I was looking at and thinking about other work that I had seen at Crystal Bridges and at the Smithsonian work that I had seen in the process of researching my dissertation and writing my dissertation, but also PAFA's sweeping collection as the oldest American art museum. They basically have kind of the best of the best in the collection. So thinking about all of these works um, and thinking about artists from the region within PAFA's collection, but also thinking about artists from outside the region that were making work about the region. And I will be frank, it is very difficult to kind of like, it's a slow and steady wins the race deal when figuring out what constitutes Appalachian art in an American art collection that doesn't have keyword searches for Appalachia or, you know, because this has never been established in these American art collections. So you have to think about artists like I had to think about artists that I knew were from Appalachia, like Andy Warhol and Charles Birchfield. Um, but then think about states that are Appalachian and parts of those states that are Appalachian. And if these people spent time there or if they were from there and if the subject matter that I'm looking at looks like Appalachian mountains, maybe I should investigate that or there's coal in the subject matter. So maybe I should investigate that. So it was really a slow roll in putting a list of artists together based on Appalachia because I had to look at all these different things, knowing that I couldn't really keyword search um, specifically for more than a few works. Um, so after doing all this research, I um, basically thought about breaking this exhibition into three themes. I really wanted to break it into a million themes because there was so much in PAFA's collection. But I broke the three things into the machine in the garden, which is a re reference to a book by Leo Marx, which is about how industrialization broke up um, the pastoral landscape, um, extraction and exchange, which is about coal and timbering and all of this dissemination of natural resources. And then, as I mentioned, more than land or sky, which was a nod to that Smithsonian exhibition, but also a nod to local color writing about Appalachia that led to this kind of obsession with the geography um, amongst artists. So, um, so I compiled this really massive list of works and kind of went from there. Um, but I also was thinking about educational history from PAFA because PAFA is obviously one of the oldest art schools as well as oldest American art museum. So there was one show in particular that I was thinking about when I got to PAFA um, that I saw in 2017, which was World War I in American Art, um, which was a show that I believe Bob Casolino worked on when he was still at PAFA. And I was thinking about an essay that I read in that catalog um, by Alexander Nemiroff about, 
about Charles Birchfield. Um, and when I read that, um, I was just starting my dissertation research and it mentioned Charles Birchfield being from Ohio. And I did some investigation. He's from Appalachian, Ohio. And also it mentioned um, kind of his anxiety around being drafted into World War I, but also his depiction of specifically white violets in an old coal mine. Um, so this was kind of my jumping off point in terms of writing about my dissertation, but also thinking about Paphos collection through this exhibition. And also Charles Birchfield in general, who was Thankfully, has a massive body of work, kept great records. I've spent a lot of time at the Birchfield Penny um, reading about his experience in Appalachia and how that followed him to Buffalo. And he basically made work about the region his entire life, even though he wasn't actively living in the region for the second half of his, of his life. So PAFA has three pieces by Birchfield. Um, Hilltop at High Noon is in Layers of Liberty, but End of Day is unfortunately not, but it is referenced um, because of the light limits that it has. Um, but again, you can see it's another kind of mine extraction themed work. Um, so building off of that, another work that I have been obsessed with for many years that I knew was in Pafa's collection is Philip Evergood's Mine Disaster. And it's kind of one of the premier works in Layers of Liberty. Um, and Evergood himself was not from Appalachia, um, but he spent time there and also uh, was a student of George Luke's, which I'll talk a little bit more about, who was from Appalachia, um, the Ashcan artist. So um, thinking about Mind Disaster, which is a massive kind of, it's one painting, but it is broken up into a triptych within this one painting, um, and how that represented Appalachia and extraction um, was at the forefront of the development of this exhibition. And then I was also thinking about artists like Doc's Thrash, which many people don't know is actually from Appalachian, Georgia, um, before he moved to Philadelphia. So he's associated with Philadelphia, associated with the carborundum print method, um, but he himself is Appalachia and Appalachian, and he has made a lot of works that reference his history growing up in Appalachia. Um, and he's included, there are two works by him included in Layers of Liberty. Um, so one of the things that I um, tried to do in defining Appalachian regionalism, but also in um, planning this exhibition was to be as diverse as I could um, in the representation of Appalachia to undo some of these stereotypes. So undoing this stereotype of the region being predominantly white, you know, predominantly conservative, you know, all of the things that I mentioned before with the, you know, poor white trash and the clannishness and all of these things, I wanted to uh, upend these as I was compiling this show and compiling this list of artists um, in the process. So one of the uh, my favorite paintings of all time in Paphos collection, which has actually ended up on a lot of things related to layers of liberty, which makes me really happy, is this Hubert Davis painting, Spring in the Coal Regions, which one of the exciting things about Appalachian regionalism is there are a lot of unknown artists um, that have yet to be discovered that, that can be defined within this regional aesthetic, but also eco-critically and in a lot of other ways. So Hubert Davis is one of these artists that there's not really a lot known about him and Paffa just has this one painting in their collection, but his work is about the region um, and, and, and it lives in a collection uh, with a caretaker elsewhere in Pennsylvania. So hopefully that's one of the things that I will be looking into in the future and finding more about um, Hubert Davis, whose work is also in the Smithsonian's collection. Um, so one thing I will mention, just traveling back in time a little bit, um, and I'm going to speed this up because I'm going too slowly. I want to get through lots of things. So um, before I started as a fellow at PAFA, um, there was a Terra Foundation convening in the summer of 2023, and that was kind of my first introduction into the vaults. Um, and I got to see the Lewis Sloan piece. Um, that is in Layers of Liberty, but also this Beverly Buchanan, which is unfortunately not in uh, Layers of Liberty. But I got to kind of like feel out some of the Appalachian material during this convening. 
um, which was scholars and artists that came together to talk about the reinstallation at PAFA. Um, you can see that Wang is in the picture on the uh, left, as well as Will um, DeLongo. Um, so that was a really good experience in trying to figure out what PAFA's collection kind of had um, in person. Um, and I also, that was my introduction to Henry McCarter, who was a longtime teacher at PAFA, but also a phenomenal artist. And PAFA has a pretty large collection of his work, but he spent a lot of time kind of finding respite in Appalachia from Philadelphia and making work about it, um, which is where this Morgantown piece comes in. So um, I also spent a lot of time, as I mentioned earlier, in the vaults. Um, in the historic landmark building, but also in um, in the other building and just kind of going rack by rack and looking at things and seeing if that looked like Appalachian landscapes or and just kind of like snowballing from there. So two of the artists that I discovered during that process were Priscilla Longshore Garrett, who's from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and also Clyde Singer, who's from Appalachian, Ohio. And both of these works are in need of conservation, so they were not included in uh, Layers of Liberty, but they're fascinating um, in terms of uh, the perspective of queer artists um, and their kind of interpretation of the Appalachian landscape and doing this kind of between the wars. So um, hopefully I can deep dive into these pieces a little bit more in the future, but there is a Priscilla Longshore Garrett piece in Years of Liberty. Um, this particular piece could not be included, unfortunately, um, due to the restoration. And I also wanted to briefly talk about um, some of the works that were restored for Layers of Liberty. And this John Carroll piece was another that I discovered through research and seen, seen in the vault that this piece existed. Um, and then finding out that it was actually representative of Appalachian, Ohio, because he went to school in Cincinnati. Um, and then seeing this work go to flux conservation and be restored and then included in Layers of Liberty. Um, and for those of you that have seen the show or haven't seen the show, um, the chat label explains what was done restoration wise in order to stabilize this painting um, for Layers of Liberty and hopefully the reinstallation as well. Um, and another piece by McCarter was also cleaned um, for and put into a new frame for Layers of Liberty. Um, so this piece is also visible in the show and was restored for the process. Um, and then thankfully, one of the uh, really cool things that happened in the process of planning this is we had a gentleman reach out um, by, the, by the name of Alan Peterowski, who was wanting to gift uh, this painting by Esther Pressoir to PAFA. Um, and it was kind of brought into my orbit um, by Dr. Anna Marley and Dr. Bobby Webb. Um, and I investigated it and found out that she was in an artist colony in Appalachian, Pennsylvania and her normal, and she was a queer artist um, active between the wars, but she um, normally did paintings of flowers and self-portraits of herself, as you can see here, smoking a cigarette, nude. Um, but when she was in this artist colony in Appalachian, Pennsylvania, she basically painted the destruction that she saw from the mining industry and the timber industry. So we ended up acquiring this painting, having it restored, and it's on view in Layers of Liberty, and it's now part of um, half his collection. So some more things that I was thinking about, because there's obviously the elephant in the room, in my opinion, when thinking about Appalachian regionalism is settler colonialism, because we came over as immigrants. I myself as an Appalachian have a German and Scots Irish immigrant background um, from both sides of my family. Um, and we obviously took land from indigenous people and we murdered them in the process. So it's important to kind of reckon with that history of ind indigeneity in addition to, you know, immigrants and how that all worked itself out. Um, so right as you walk into Layers of Liberty, the very first painting that you see if you're going, you know, clockwise around the exhibition is this cartoon by Benjamin West. 
of Penn's treaty with the Indians. So thinking about Lenape land, which a large portion of it constituted parts of Appalachian, Pennsylvania and New York, but uh, thinking about how that land was taken, how the Native Americans were oppressed in the process um, and how extraction was happening even then in timbering these old growth forests and acquiring this land from the Lenape. Um, and then the image on the right by Alexander Lawson is um, kind of like an early stereotype where you see these gentlemen kind of like showing this wilderness scene of the snake that's really menacing that they're about to fire at as they're exploring Appalachian, Pennsylvania around the Susquehanna. Um, so I wanted to have these dichotomies um, kind of early on in the exhibition to build that foundation. And then also, as I mentioned before, it was important to me for these educational histories to tell them through PAFA um, and how even though artists like Evergood were not from Appalachia, he had a teacher that was from Appalachia who was, you know, part of the eight, was an Ashcan school artist. He was associated with New York and Philadelphia, but he actually grew up around Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So he was exposed to coal country. He made a lot of work about coal mining and miners from this empathetic perspective, not the stereotypic perspective. So I think that affected ever good later on when he took on the subject himself. Um, and then larger histories of, um, of these educational connections. So there's a wall uh, by the John Carroll piece, Agatha, um, of McCarter and Blanche Lazelle and Grace Martin Taylor and Grace Martin Taylor. Her teachers were Blanche Lazelle and Henry McCarter. And that combination together kind of shows the influence of the two artists and kind of this larger network of Appalachian education. Um, and those of you that are not familiar with Blanche Lazelle, she is a West Virginia printmaker um, who was really foundational in the development of a woodblock printing process, but she spent a lot of her time also in Provincetown. But she's an example of this cosmopolitan aspect to Appalachian art per production that has really not been looked at thoroughly and hopefully will be as this study continues. Um, and Grace Martin Taylor, that piece is the only loan um, that was in the exhibition or is in the exhibition. And then I also wanted to focus on um, artists like Herbert Pullinger, who was from Philadelphia, but he spent a lot of time in Appalachian Philadelphia kind of showing the different industrializations. Um, so I have this suite of all of the kind of like extractive industries in Appalachian Pennsylvania and Herbert Pullinger's work combined with um, Herbert Johnson. So we've got two Herberts here. <laughs> Herbert Johnson, who was a political cartoonist who is being critical of the coal industry kind of in tandem with Herbert Pulliner's kind of nationalizing of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania industry. And Pulliner was doing this like 25 years before um, the development of New Deal stuff. So he was kind of like you know, early on in this industrial revolution. So I wanted to make pairings like that, where it's like criticality mixed with extraction and artists that were, you know, making comments on this. Um, and of course, I wanted to include a couple installation shots from Layers of Liberty. Um, on the left, you can see a Fussell, uh, Charles Fussell piece that is in the show, as well as a Luke's on the bottom. So two more kind of educational based um, PAFA histories. And then on the right is the Denzinger piece um, about extraction and pouring, and he's actually from Pittsburgh. So um, I'm winding down a little bit because I want to get to questions, um, but I wanted to kind of end with um, basically what my goals are in the future, hopefully through this exhibition, as I hope to have more of these exhibitions in national museums. I hope that it leads to museums rethinking their holdings. Um, kind of through this Appalachian perspective, but also I, I see this as a uniting factor um, in the field of art history, but also in the humanities and kind of reckoning with these histories of labor and class and race and gender and religion and settler colonialism, um, because it's all a microchasm for the stuff that we're going through on a national and a global scale. Um, and I think that in 
bringing this work together, it will bring people together and kind of open up the conversation and make art seem less elite and more accessible um, to people, not just from the Appalachian region, but from all over the country. Um, and then I just wanted to end with uh, basically this after the flood piece um, by Anthony de Arolio, which I'm probably mispronouncing. And he, this was a purchase prize um, when he was attending PAFA in 2004, but it is about flooding in Tennessee. Um, and this was back in 2004. And obviously I'm sure many of you have seen um, the after effects of Hurricane Helene. Um, and what's going on in Asheville and Eastern Tennessee. Um, so, you know, this is a larger problem. We need to kind of talk about climate change and institutional critique and all of these things also through the study of Appalachian regionalism in museums. So thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Ali. You covered so much in just 45 minutes. Um, and I am sure there are lots of questions. Um, you can put your question in the chat. You can use the chat function or use the hand raise function um, and I can call on you. Um, but yes, who has questions? Can I ask a question and congratulate Allie? Yes, of course. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hi, Ali. It's so nice to see you and Hello. so nice to see everybody at PAFA. Uh, it feels very weird to be zooming in from Toledo, Ohio, on the other side of the Appalachians. Um, but yeah, Ali, congratulations. This is fantastic. I'm so thrilled that uh, your exhibition has been receiving so much attention. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you thought while you were putting this together, uh, obviously you didn't know what was gonna be happening with the presidential election, um, but uh, with, you know, you show how timely this is with the, the, the after effects of Helene and then our current election cycle. Can you talk about how your approach to looking at things from the 18th century to today um, really um, foregrounds the importance of Appalachia today as well as historically? Um, I would say that uh, it's timely because uh, literally the stereotypes of Appalachia are in our face with this presidential election. And I think it was the, um, the HYY article that mentioned Vance because it was like right about Layers of Liberty, it was right when he announced his vice presidential inclusion. Um, so I think that, you know, the flooding with Helene is timely because of climate change at the hands of these massive corporations. And then we think about J.D. Vance and his hillbilly elegy and how it just perpetuated the stereotype of Appalachia and like didn't help the region, even though he's claiming this Appalachian identity. So I think that it's just kind of a reckoning for things that have been happening since the 18th century, you know, amped up in the 19th century and have just been perpetuated into the 20th and 21st. So I think that it's an opportunity to confront all of these things institutionally, politically, culturally, um, and like I said, use it as a uniting factor for us to make real change because, you know, there's a lot of us and there's there's only a few billionaires that are controlling all of these things. So hopefully it switches the narrative around and, um, and lets us move forward. Thank you. That kind of ties into our um, next set of question, one of which was, um, is Hill Hillbilly Elegy accurate? And then also um, questions around influence on Andy Warhol and influence of Black Mountain College. I'm assuming the Appalachian influence on both of those um, the artists and the institution, um, if you wanna talk about that. Sure, so I will answer the accuracy of Hillbilly Elegy. I would say no. Um, and the Appalachian Studies community immediately panned J.D. Vance. Uh, I was lucky enough to be at an Appalachian Studies conference where Vance was on a panel um, and he was booed off stage, um, essentially, uh, by scholars of Appalachian Studies and how he portrayed Appalachia and basically uh, was critical and um, 
outright mean of the opioid crisis and working class people calling them lazy, all of these things within his book, which someone from the region would not do that. They would not tear down their own culture. So that just shows a lot kind of like reading through the lines. But there's been a lot of responses to Hillbilly Elegy that have kind of like put Vance in his place from a scholarly perspective um, as well. So on to the next question of Black Mountain College, Andy Warhol. So Black Mountain College is hugely influential in my study of Appalachian regionalism. And specifically, I have a chapter in my dissertation about pedagogy and how contemporary art pedagogy would not exist without Appalachia and Black Mountain College and the forefathers to Black Mountain College, like Arrow Mount and Penland and Berea and all of these other schools that were very international and very progressive for the time um, that kind of set the ground for Black Mountain College. So Black Mountain College is amazing and it will be at a forefront. I, I really planned on including a large Black Mountain College narrative in Layers of Liberty, but there just wasn't space and time for it. But there will be more time in the future. And from the Andy Warhol perspective, I originally had some slides of his Appalachian work, um, but he destroyed a lot of it because he didn't want to be so associated with that identity, which I resonate with, I understand, because that's how I was at one time. Um, but he grew up in Pittsburgh. His father was a coal miner. He was an he was a first generation immigrant. Um, so, you know, if anyone's familiar with The Living Room by Andy Warhol, that's probably his most famous Appalachian work. And he did that when he was finishing up at Carnegie um, in Pittsburgh. So that is a view of his childhood living room on the eve of his father's funeral. Um, and there's all of these craft objects that are in the living room and kind of like um, spiritual aspects of things. And there's just like a lot of, of things to unpack with Andy Warhol. And also considering what he took on as an artist, um, you know, he kind of made working class subject matter, um, even though he was elevated you know, substantially as a celebrity, but, you know, he still had this kind of working class aesthetic, which was cultivated in Appalachia. So more to come on that in the future too, hopefully. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I just wanted to add um, Jenny Sorkin's book, Living as Form, has a really great chapter about Black Mountain College. And there's this whole section that talks about places like the intersection with Penland too. So if people are interested in that, I would check that out. And then that was my major, one of the critiques about the big Andy Warhol biography that came out a couple years ago by Blake Gopnik. It, he doesn't, he has an opportunity to go really into Appalachia, but he, and he does a little bit in terms of Pittsburgh and thinking about that history, but not enough. Um, but I'm going to keep going because we have a lot of questions here. So maybe you can go back to these in your slideshow, Ali. Yeah, um, the six Pullinger industry drawings look like they may have been designs for a public building, maybe panels over doors. Do you know any more about this series? I looked into everything I could find on Pullinger considering these, and I didn't find anything uh, really that would allude to that. Uh, it could be possible, but honestly, he didn't even turn these cartoons into prints that I could find. Um, so maybe he had plans for something that just never materialized. But Paffa has a massive amount of his work. Um, and these are the only works that are in this red Conte cartoon form. Um, but hopefully something more will materialize and I can find more out about them in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, Gail was happy to see this exhibition and write about it for the Broad Street Review. Thank you, Gail. We are so happy to have your writing out there. Um, and then the next question is from David Donna Behrend. Was there much Native American um, considering any tribes artists in in the huge region? Um, so yeah, I guess do you want to speak to indigenous? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of history. Um, unfortunately, not a lot in PAFA's collection. So uh, really like the West was one of the only pieces that I had to work with. But in other collections, I found a lot. But unfortunately, the Trail of Tears, you know, decimated the Appalachian indigenous tribes with the exception of the Cherokee in Western North Carolina. So there's like uh, an ongoing rich history with the Cherokee in Western North Carolina, but it has to kind of be more pieced together with the rest of the um, the
the region, but that's something that I'm definitely committed to um, and committed to remediating in this kind of like overlooking of Appalachian regionalism. Great, thank you. Okay, we have about five more minutes. Um, so we do have time for a couple more questions. Um, and this question is, what are examples of contemporary art that explore the history and current struggles of the region? Great question. Oh, I have so much. And I left a lot of it out because I was like, I'm just not going to have time. But I I have so many artist friends and I've curated a lot of artists into shows about Appalachian contemporary art. And they are actively engaged that in, in everything that I've mentioned today. They're actively engaged in um, stereotypes. They're actively engaged in the opioid crisis. They're actively engaged in eco-criticism and cultural history and the archive and all of these things. Um, so I would say that there is a, a massive history and I hope that there can be a, a contemporary art exhibition of Appalachian art curated by someone from the region in a national museum in the very near future. Um, there's like a small part of me or actually a large part of me that would really like to see the Smithsonian do a rehashing of that more than land or sky exhibition um, in like a in like a now format and see how that goes. But uh, Appalachian art, contemporary Appalachian art, is so underobserved and and it's active in the region from a regional co context and shown in regional galleries and museums, but it hasn't really made it to a national stage. So hopefully that happens soon. Yes. Um, okay. Sorry, I had a visitor that I was talking to, so I'm sorry if I missed anything, but it looks like Catherine is sharing, yeah, some of the other press coverage that this exhibition has received. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for your kind words on the excellent research and very courageous and timely take on the topic. Does anyone have one, one last question that they want to make sure Ali answers before we sign off? Well, hearing none, um, I will just invite you all to see Layers of Liberty in the Annenberg and Tuttleman Galleries here at PAP in the, in the Hamilton building. Um, it's up for another month, so please come take a look. Um, we have some family programming coming up in the gallery this weekend. Details for that can be found online, um, so we would love to see you there taking it in. Um, and we will be back in two weeks with our next iteration of Art at Noon. So um, October 16th, look out for the website on the website for information on that and also your email. Um, there is a free day. Thank you, Ingrid. Uh, there is a free day on Sunday. So make sure you check that out. Um, and that also um, will get you into the downstairs exhibition, uh, Philadelphia Revealed, uh, which is that Waterkent collection. Um, so thank you so much, Allie, for your time and wonderful presentation. Thank you all for being here um, in attendance. And thank you again for the Baron family for supporting uh, this initiative. We are very grateful. So I hope everyone thank has a good couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Thanks, Allie. Bye, Leah. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.